One of the key themes of Philip K. Dick's novel, The Android's Dream of Electric Sheep, is the technology that human beings have developed and how they incorporate it into their lives and what effects it actually has on them as people. And technology can be good in some respects and bad in other respects. We find this to be the case with the very first bit of technology that is introduced in the first paragraphs of chapter one of the work. So the very first sentence runs like this. A merry little surge of electricity piped by automatic alarm from the mood organ beside his bed awakened Rick Deckard. Surprise! It always surprised him to find himself awake without prior notice. He rose from the bed, stood up in his multicolored pajamas, and stretched. Now in her bed, his wife, Erin, opened her gray, unmerry eyes, blinked, then groaned, and shut her eyes again. You set your pen field too weak, he said to her. I'll reset it, and you'll be awake, and... Keep your hand off my settings, her voice held bitter sharpness. I don't want to be awake. He seated himself beside her, bent over her, and explained softly, If you set the surge up high enough, you'll be glad you're awake. That's the whole point. At setting C, it overcomes the threshold barring consciousness, as it does for me. Friendly, because he felt well disposed towards the world, his setting had been at D, he patted his ba her bare, pale shoulder. And then she says, get your crude cop's hand away. Now, two people in very different moods on waking up, but it's in some respect because of what's going on with this mood organ where you can dial up various affectivities, moods, feelings, desires. And this is a piece of technology that, that goes straight to the human brain. And human beings are not merely, you could say, victims of it or passive patients of it. They get to decide what they're going to do in terms of dialing these moods. There's actually a catalog, as we find much later on, that Erin is looking through trying to determine what kind of mood she should set things at. And there's, there's basically two kinds of things. There's the mood itself, and then there's the, the gain or the amount that you can set it for. So Descartes sets his to wake up in a good mood in the morning, and Erin apparently doesn't set it high enough and wakes up in her usual kind of despondent and depressed mood. And so then there's a whole conversation after this. But the key thing here to, to get across is this apparatus, the Penfield mood organ, taps directly into the human brain and allows certain affectivities to be reliably, reliably produced and at particular levels. So it's a way, you could say, for a human being to decide their own mood through the use of this apparatus. Is this completely new? No, I mean, we can do this through what we can call technologies of the self or philosophical exercises or spiritual practices. So there's an entire side of agency on that. We can do it through taking drugs. You know, if you take antidepressants, the idea is that you're trying to put yourself into not necessarily a single mood, but at least a better mood overall. And we could go on and on and on. You know, we could say that uh, music is used to put us into certain moods, particularly in relation to like film and television or commercials. And so there's lots of lots of ways that human beings can already affect their moods. This just makes it more precise and predictable. So what are the different moods that are available? Some of them have numbers. Some of them are just mentioned. The first thing that Descartes considers dialing up, he's, he's getting into you know, an argument, uh, he's irritable, and so you know, his wife is giving him a hard time for killing androids, which is his job. And he's, here we go. Um, at his console, he hesitated between dialing for a thalamic suppressant, which would abolish his mood of rage, or a thalamic stimulant, which would make him irked enough to win the argument, right? So he's considering tinkering around with his own 
current mentality. And then Irian says, if you dial for greater venom, then I'll dial the same. I'll dial the maximum and you'll see a fight that makes every argument we've had up to now seem like nothing. Dial and see, just try me, right? So there's an initial thing. So you, can, you can make yourself um, less angry or you can make yourself more angry, right? Those are possibilities to the level of venom. What does Rick dial for himself instead? A business-like professional attitude, which is probably kind of similar to one of the other later moods that he has. So there's a range of moods that are good for, you know, common life, the workplace, and that's what he dials up. And then she says something to him that's quite striking um, because he says, I'm, I'm scheduling myself for, uh, uh, you know, particular moods, examining the schedule for January 3rd, 1992, right? He sees that this professional attitude was, was called for. And she says, my schedule for today lists a six hour self-accusatory depression. <laughs> and Rick says, why the hell did you dial that? What? That's, that's terrible. I mean, it's kind of funny that it's even an option in the mood organ, but she's like, well, I found that it's actually quite, quite helpful for me. Why? So she says, I was sitting here one afternoon and um, there was this, you know, advertisement that came on for Mountie Bank lead cod pieces. So for a minute I shut off the sound and I heard the building. The, and then Rick says, empty apartments. And so this is something that is affecting people's moods, the uh, lack of um, cohabitators, you could say, in the midst of a big city. And so she finds that this is actually a useful mood for her to, to go into. Why? She says, at the moment when I had the TV sound off, I was in a 382 mood. I had just dialed it. I heard the emptiness intellectually, but I didn't feel it. My first reaction consisted of being grateful. We could afford a Penfield mood organ. Then I realized how unhealthy it was, sensing the absence of life, not just in this building, but everywhere, and not reacting. So sometimes the moods that you pick out can conceal what should be your, you call it your existential attitude towards things. So she sets every so often a self-accusatory uh, depression. And um, she says, uh, I left the TV sound off, sat down on my mood organ and experimented. I finally found a setting for despair. So I put it on my schedule for twice a month. I think that's a reasonable amount of time to feel hopeless about everything, about staying here on earth after everyone who's smart has immigrated. And then Rick points out that that could put you into like a feedback loop, though. Uh, you're apt to stay in it, not dial your way out. Despair about total reality is self-perpetuating. And she says, oh, you know, not a problem. I actually program an automatic resetting for three hours later. 481, uh, awareness of the manifold possibilities open to me in the future, new hope that, and he says, I, I know 481. He, he uses that combination himself. So this is something that uh, is, you might say, a little bit of a palate cleanser or a reset, this openness to the manifold possibilities uh, that, are, that are in front of you, an optimistic mood. And then we get to some other quite interesting moods that you can set, um, one of which is actually self-referential. But before that, we have 888, the desire to watch TV no matter what is on it. So if you're really bored, you can just set that and then just zone out in front of the TV. I, I kind of think that a lot of people have that in their heads already uh, with respect to streaming and music and you know YouTube and things along those lines. Three is the uh, desire to dial a mood. So if you find yourself unable to decide or just kind of listless, you can dial that and then that feeds you back into the interaction with the uh, Penfield. Now, she says something very interesting about that. 
She says, I can't dial a setting that stimulates my cerebral cortex into wanting to dial. If I don't want to dial, I don't want to dial that most of all, because then I will want to dial and wanting to dial is right now the most alien drive I can imagine. I just want to sit here on the bed and stare at the floor. So she wants, she wants out of this, at least at some times, this feedback loop. And then um, they, you know, sort of reconcile. And she actually says, I, I'll dial anything you want me to, to be ecstatic, sexual bliss. I'll feel, I feel so bad. I'll even endure that. What the hell? What difference does it make? And then Rick says, I'll, I'll dial for both of us. At her console, he dialed 594, pleased acknowledgement of husband's superior wisdom in all matters. So he's, you know, um, in some respects, treating her as, as uh, an invalid or as somebody who's lower than him. He's uh, using it to, to get her to view him as uh, a way she didn't just earlier as being right and stuff like that. And then he dials himself a creative and fresh attitude towards his job, which he's definitely going to need because he's kind of you know, burnt out on his job, quite frankly, and we'll get more burnt out as things go on. Now, we encounter the Penfield unit um, being discussed at, you know, some length. Uh, later on, Roy Beatty, one of the androids, actually the leader of the androids who have escaped to Earth and are being hunted by um, Rick Deckard, um, sets up a Penfield and he, he's got it connected to a tripwire. So he says, um, this assembly has a Penfield unit built into it. When the alarm has been triggered, it radiates a mood of panic to the intruder. Unless he acts very fast, which he may, enormous panic. I have the gain turned all the way up. No human being can remain in the vicinity more than a matter of seconds. That's the nature of panic. It leads to random circus motions, purposeless flight, and muscle and neural spasms. So this is a way for them to try to kill the uh, bounty hunter, Rick Deckard. Um, later on, towards the very end, we have a very interesting uh, set of passages. Deckard has... Uh, finished, you know, the fights and, and, and killing of the androids. He's, he's gone off. He's uh, been involved with, with Mercer. There's all sorts of things going on. He's out in the desert. He finds a toad and picks it up and then drives back uh, to, to see his wife. Now, here's where the passage begins. At the Penfield mood organ, Erin Deckard sat with her right index finger touching the number dial, but she did not dial. She felt too listless and ill to want anything, a burden which closed off the futures and any possibilities which it might once have contained. If Rick were here, she thought, he'd get me to dial three, and that way I'd find myself wanting to dial something important, ebullient joy, or if not that, then possibly an 888, the desire to watch TV no matter what's on it. And so she's, you know, sort of speak out of the framework of the mood organ. She's in like an, you know, a real depression, not a just Penfield mood uh, uh, stimulated depression. And she's, you know, she's unable to use this device to do anything. She views it as kind of hollow. But if, if Rick is there, then he can set things right. And she says, um, here we go. Putting the knock sounded at the apartment door. Putting down the Penfield manual, she jumped up, thinking, "I don't need to dial now. I already have it. If it is Rick, he'll he'll take care of it." And you know, he, he says hi, and uh, she says, "It's nice to see you." And then he says, "I have something." And he he's uh, got the box with the toad in, and she says, I'll, "I'll fix you coffee." All of this is happening without the stimulation of the mood organ, which plays uh, such a major role, apparently, in their life, but they're kind of weaning themselves away from it by the end of the novel. So this is a very interesting, early introduced piece of technology that plays a significant role within the book, um, doesn't get brought into the movie adaptation, The Blade Runner at all, 
for uh, discussion or reference or anything like that. But um, it's, it's a major uh, theme, you could say, within this work. How much are we responsible for? How can we tinker with our moods, our desires, our inclinations, all these affective things that make up our life? 